whole sense of sharing history together for the last 25 years, starting with the the um, rollout of our currently named foundsf.org digital archive, which at one point was synonymous with the name of Shaping San Francisco. So you might remember that from kiosks at Rainbow Grocery, with kiosks at the main library, Modern Times even down the street had some kiosks. And we have been steadily adding to this participatory community history archive of the city of San Francisco. And it just needs your contributions as well. It's a great <coughs> collection of photographs. Chris can tell you a little bit about our history with um, Greg and his photographs in a minute. Um, but also we have a lot of historical content and that includes memories from people like you, actually some people in the room. And it includes a lot of primary source, <coughs> not just memoirs, but historical <coughs> breakdowns of what happens in different times in history, what has happened, how we see ourselves within this fixture of a city that has certain ideas and iconography about it, and actually we like to go beyond that and show what other stories are available, what other perspectives can we have instead of the ones that we hear over and over and over again. So this is why we invite you to contribute. Maybe you have a perspective you don't see elsewhere. Maybe you have a family story that has never been told. Maybe you found a box of photographs and they went, took you on a really amazing journey to find out about your family and where your family worked and went to school. So all of that is welcome. That's a long way to say that's what we've been doing for 25 years. And in 2006, well maybe even a couple of years before, Chris started some bicycle tours, but we really got serious in 2006 with doing this, bringing people together to talk about, debate, question, learn about, um, just enjoy together the sense of being part of history and knowing more about the history we might not have actually been alive during, but learning about what's come before us as well. Um, and so in 2006, actually our first speaker was Greg Garner. Yeah. At a party. Yeah. Yeah. And we were over on 9th Street in the Counterpulse building, if you remember that on Mission and 9th. And um, now we've been here since 2012 in the Eric Casada Center for Culture and Politics, which is also a space, community space available to you to rent if you have meetings or different workshops or things you want to do here. We um, have a lot of great people with us tonight, not just Greg, but the Planet Drum Foundation is celebrating 50 years this year. That's so we're finishing the Planet Drum is Judy Berg, Judy Goldhaft, and um, her team, and folks getting all of this collage together, as I mentioned. Um, I'm not gonna remember everyone's name, so Judy, you'll have to thank people later. But they have a lot of beautiful visual material, and a lot of, it's really um, in-depth, insightful stuff about ecology and our, uh, you know, it's not just the planet, it's about like the soil right here, and bioregionalism came to be through Peter Berg and terminology like that that we understand very intrinsically now was because of the work of Planet Drug Foundation. And Nancy Morita, who has created this amazing map of San Francisco it's from right, right behind before you. this map, <laughs> half of the map, um, and to what we recognize as the city peninsula today. So go over and you can buy it and take it home and have it to look at every day. I really recommend that. It's kind of an amazing thing to have in your own living space. Um, we have some books for Shaving San Francisco. There's some free Raise the Stakes um, papers at the front and some bunch grass seeds. There's a lot going on tonight. And so um, we are gonna try to get started now and not delay you any further. Um, Chris, you wanna say a little bit about um, getting started with Greg in our um, archive, and then we'll pass it off to Nancy to introduce Greg. Yeah, I don't want to speak longer. Greg Gar was the source of almost all the photographs that we got in the very beginning. So actually, I remember sitting in his apartment on Belvedere Street in 1995, boxes of photos that came out of his amazing collection and fit, going through, oh, can I use this one? Oh, can I use this one? And then the technology drama that we've gone through tonight, which 
we won't bore you with all the details. But just to say that the scanning we did back then was at 150 DPI, which meant that they were not usable in the near future after that. But this was about time, it was 1995, who knew you know, that everything was going to do what it did. So thank you, Greg, for uh, being part of the project for even longer than we've existed. And thank you all for coming tonight. And uh, Nancy, you're next. Or maybe Judy is, I'm not sure. Just to begin because we're having a little bit of a late start, but I just wanted to mention that Planet Drama is involved with putting people back in place. There's a little quiz over there it's called what, Where Are You At? It's a quiz that tells you what you don't know rather than what you do know. And uh, one of the things that Planet Drama has always done is putting people back in the place where they live and living there in a a less exploitive way, a more cooperative way that we're part of the, the system here. So when we started seven, 1973, mm -hmm. the idea were very new, but these days it's not so new. As you may have no, may, may or may not notice, the dams on the Klamath River are being taken down. Yeah. Yeah. Street, you'll see that this area is now has signs talking about the indigenous people that lived here before Europeans came. So Nancy peels back the buildings from the uh, map of San Francisco. So go Nancy. <laughs> uh, Judy and Planet Trump Foundation were sponsors of the map that I made, which is comparing what San Francisco looked like ecologically, sand dunes, grasslands, coastal scrub, et cetera, um, you know, sort of inch by inch, um, with the city today and showing um, many of the places that have survived. My map is now 30 years old, so some of the things have gotten even better. <laughs> We've lost some, but some have gotten better, like the Presidio restoration and so on. Um, I met Greg in working on my map because Greg knows all these places where there's little vestiges left of really amazing wild things that he has kept wild. Um, and uh, so I really appreciate you, Greg, for so many things. And some of you probably know him a lot, but I'm going to give you a little introduction in case some of you know all these things. <laughs> <laughs> An enthusiastic and devoted hands-on habitat restoration for more than, I started writing 30 and then 40, <laughs> 50 years. Greg Gar has the distinction of having had the police called on him by a concerned neighbor for pulling out those lovely yellow flowers, <laughs> terribly invasive French broom flowers. <laughs> for those of you who may not somehow be familiar with French broom, it is now the California invasive species list, classified as a noxious weed in California, where it has taken over 100,000 acres, oh. displacing the native plants in its wake, including here in San Francisco. And it does have bright yellow flowers before they turn to an arsenal of seeds, documenting up to 6,733 seeds per square meter. Amazing broom pollen. As a child, Greg planted many cypress, and correct me if I get any of this wrong, planted many cypress, pine, and other uh, saplings on Tank Hill, Twin Peaks, and Corona Heights on public open spaces. At that time, thinking, as did many of us, including myself, that more trees were better. He diligently watered them through his childhood, and they grew tall, strong, and wide. Years later, he learned from a knowledgeable California Native Plant Society person that those non-native trees were shading out some of the last wildflower areas, causing the wildflowers to disappear. So Greg, being a responsible steward, endeavored to rectify the error of his ways and cut down or grow those particular trees uh, and was caught and came under the investigation of the state attorney's office <laughs> for quite some time. Well, there were my 
my tree. Yeah. <laughs> Story has it that back then, Park and Rec, the Recreation and Parks Department, wanted Greg to pay to replant the trees <laughs> that he had planted, cared for, and later taken out. <laughs> now we know that Greg was right, and the Natural Areas Program is enlightened and doing good work. But Greg was ahead of his time. He's been ahead of his time for a long time. Greg grew up on Mount Davidson, spending much of his childhood outdoors. He became familiar with the native plants and animals which lived in abundance across the grasslands, brushlands, and sand dunes, that, that many of which were still here back then. He knows, for example, the native dune tansy, a host plant for up to 60 kinds of butterflies. Mm. Maybe you want to plant some of these. Talk to Greg. Um, and which used to grace the sand dunes that once stretched here from Golden Gate Park to Buena Vista Park, north to Point Lobos, south to Fort Fenson, and of course out to the Pacific Ocean. The aromas, colors, and interconnected web of life in the many native habitats here are not only in Greg's memories, but I think are part of his being. As the city expanded and the dunes and hillsides were stripped of the vegetation to make way for roads and buildings, Greg was there to witness firsthand the destruction of the things and creatures that he knew and loved, and of the whole web of life that was being summarily torn apart for something different. Watching the natural world shrinking, Greg devoted his energies to preserving the vestiges of wild nature that were left. Pulling invasive plants out to liberate native wildflowers, removing trash and dog poop from, dog, from public areas dear to him every week, every week, every week. Advocating for the preservation of areas of special natural significance and planting and caring for native plants here um, that he grew from seed at his native plant nursery, which is at Frederick and Ontario, and you can go there and visit, and making them available to others, you, perhaps, for replanting here in San Francisco. This expands habitat restoration, helps people best to come to love and care for them. We have great to thank for so much of the native plant biodiversity and animal biodiversity that has survived in San Francisco to this day. Tonight, Greg is here to kindle in you and us a better understanding of what it was of the natural environment that was lost and from where, and to invite you to let this information into your heart, where it can hopefully stir you to influence the future. The slideshow you're about to see, Greg has crafted from his lifetime collection of tens of thousands more. Of historical photos <laughs> of San Francisco. Enter this world from the not so distant past and join Greg on this really mind blowing journey through time and possibility. Okay. Technology has just been crazy tonight. Um, originally, I used to do all my presentations with uh, Kodachrome slides, and, and now we've uh, advanced or degressed back uh, into uh, flash drive. And since uh, we put the flash drive, we put all the images on at much higher than they should have been, uh, there was a big delay. But now I think we've got it together. So um, my first point is that think of the entire universe, and there's only one place that we know of where life exists in the universe. Now, life probably exists somewhere else in the universe, but what we know right now is the only place where life exists is this planet right here. And our philosophy should be totally based on preserving life on this planet. And unfortunately, what we're doing is if you took the Starship Enterprise and gave all the crew sledgehammers and had them pounding on the bulkhead to put holes in the 
uh, the enterprise, that's what we're doing to this planet. And we've got to change our ways. I mean, we've made some improvements. I mean, we, uh, we had to save the Bay Movement. So we were able to save a portion of San Francisco Bay, 450 uh, square miles out of 730 square miles. Uh, we stopped freeway construction and tore down freeways, which was really positive. And believe it or not, one thing that I never thought we would achieve was a permanent closure of JFK in Golden Gate Park. <laughs> and so I think that the public is ready for discipline to do whatever it takes to preserve the planet. I mean, if we don't preserve the planet, everything goes down the tube. And I'm talking about a healthy planet uh, filled with biodiversity, a diversity of life on this planet. And the images that I have just show the evolution of San Francisco over 300 years. In 300 years, we've gone from this beautiful peninsula with creeks and lakes and drifting dunes and oak woodlands into and native people who were here for 10,000 years. And we basically turned San Francisco and the Bay Area into a parking lot. And we've got to do much better than that. We've, we've been fortunate to save uh, some natural areas in San Francisco. We were fortunate to have Phil Burton leading the fight to uh, save much of the Golden Gate National Recreation Area and to uh, have uh, army bases turned into national parks. So that's a positive step, but we've, we've got to be more radical on this. So anyway, this is Nancy's map made in 1991 showing what San Francisco would have looked like uh, prior to the arrival of the Europeans in uh, 1769 with the Portal Expedition and 1776 when Anza set up a Presidio and a mission. This is from the book The Ohlone Way by Malcolm Margolin showing what San Francisco's Bay Shore would have looked like prior to the arrival of the Europeans with grizzly bear, uh, great herds of elk, deer, and antelope, great flocks of geese and pelicans flying overhead. And all of San Francisco's original tidal marshes, except for a small little area over by India Basin, uh, have pretty much been obliterated. But now we have the technology to restore tidal marshes and they're now doing it all over San Francisco Bay, which not only purifies the bay, but creates wonderful habitat for shorebirds, fish, mollusks, etc. Now, if you go back 10,000 to 15,000 years ago, sea level was 350 feet below what it is today. So if you were looking across where the Golden Gate Bridge is today, this is what the Golden Gate would have looked like 10 to 15,000 years ago. San Francisco Bay was a river valley with lots of rivers pouring fresh water into the bay and at high tide, uh, salt water would come in and there were tidal marshes all around the bay. But uh, the climate has warmed and uh, the glaciers melted uh, the polar ice caps melted, and now it's speeding up because of uh, global warming caused by human impact. So the native people were here. They got here most likely when sea level was 350 feet below what it is now, and they came across the where the Aleutian Islands are. It was a land bridge between Siberia and Alaska, and then they made their way down the coast and eventually settled here in San Francisco. Um, 
at the time of the arrival of the Europeans, there were 300,000 native people living in what is now California, and possibly as many as 50 million living in the Western Hemisphere. And of course, when our culture arrived to try to convince these people that they shouldn't worship the land, but they should be Christians, um, and they were brought into the mission system to do basically slave labor and to accept Jesus Christ as their savior, what happened is they came in contact with terrible European diseases that they had no immunity to, uh, such as smallpox, measles, influenza, bubonic plague, cholera, mumps, yellow fever, and this is very similar to what is happening to our native flora and fauna today where invasive exotic species are coming in and they have no natural enemies here and they can rapidly destroy ecosystems that have existed for hundreds of thousands of years. And that's why we do habitat restoration. Habitat restoration is one of the most rewarding things that human beings can do in this day and age when so many people are suffering from mental illness. And it's, it's for me, just having that connection with the land is so spiritually rewarding, especially I grew up in San Francisco. Um, I've lived here for 75 years, except for four years when I was in the Navy. And uh, I became very, um, connected to all the open spaces and that's why I do habitat restoration today. I also have a native plant nursery in Golden Gate Park where I, I give away free San Francisco native plants if you want to talk to me about that later. And here are the native people outside of Mission Dolores from a sketch. The oldest natural features in San Francisco are the huge rock formations, rock outcrops. This one's at, it's still there at uh, 14th and uh, Ortega, Quintara. Um, it's part of Golden Gate Heights and is one of the 32 natural areas under the jurisdiction of the Recreation and Park Department's Natural Resources Division. Uh, we had to fight hard to get the city to acquire this site. It had to go through eminent domain hearings, uh, but eventually it was acquired and that we, there are regular work parties up here and it's part of the Green Hair Street uh, area where people do plant uh, indigenous vegetation that supports the rare Green Hair Street butterfly. Here are the, here's the same rock formation today, uh, looking back to Grandview Park, another open space acquisition made by the Recreation and Park Department with open space funds in 1975. And this is, a, this is the Green Hair Street butterfly on its larval food plant, which is coast buckwheat. And this is from a mural across the street from Forest Hill Station done by Presida Eyes Muralists. And Presida is the name of one of our native creeks that used to run down un under uh, Caesar, where Caesar Chavez Street is today, Army Street when I was a kid. And uh, the creek is still there, but it's going, it goes through a storm drain instead of uh, daylighting. I mean, if we were really into preserving the land, we would daylight that creek. Mm -hmm. And Greg Gar is, is in that mural, too. Yeah, I'm on the mural, too. <laughs> <laughs> That's because I uh, let them copy a lot of my pictures uh, so they could use them in the, in the mural. Uh, this is a uh, beautiful rock outcrop above O'Shaughnessy Boulevard, below Marietta Street, above Glen Canyon Park. And uh, this property is actually owned 
by the water department, Hetch Hetchy, because there was a plan back in 1912, 1913, to have a huge reservoir where Glen Canyon Park is today. Fortunately, it didn't happen, but that's why it's still under the jurisdiction of the water department. You know what kind of rock that is? Franciscan Radiolarian Church. The way the rock got here, it's an interesting story. I mean, you know, I can go on and on, and I don't want to go on and on, but um, this uh, Franciscan Radiolarian Church was formed under an ocean 130 million years ago. It's sedimentary rock, uh, where the sediment would fall down to the bottom of the ocean and then be compacted. And in 130 million years, it slowly made its way up the coast from South America and has become stationed here in San Francisco. That's crazy. It, it, it came along the, the uh, tectonic Pacific plates. Um, and it's still moving. But, I mean, you have to go out there and measure over 130 million years. <laughs> And it's called Radiolaria Church because uh, Radiolaria are one-celled marine creatures that were fossilized within the church. Where, where is this rock outcrop? Anybody know? You gotta learn the natural areas. <laughs> this, is, this is Tank Hill. The beautiful rock outcrop on Tank Hill. Um, Franciscan Radiolarian Church, and this was the time exposure at night, and it's a pretty good shot. Oh, that's <laughs> yeah, is that because it's sitting down? You recognize this rock outcrop? Yeah. Where? Right, right on. Yeah. Um, many years ago, I used to smoke dope up there all the time. <laughs> But I've been cleaning sober for 23 years, and man, is it boring. <laughs> <laughs> and this is over on Bayview Hill that we call Indian Head Rock on Bayview Hill, which used to over. Bayview Hill is another uh, recreation park uh, natural area where we have regular work parties. And it used to be above Candlestick Park. We'll show you more pictures of that. This is Serpentine Rock at Star King Park on Petrero Hill. So Serpentine is the official rock of the state of California. And in San Francisco, it ranges from the Presidio to Lone Mountain to where the Mint is at the Bosin Market. You've seen that rock there. And then to... Uh, Hunter's Point and Petrero Hill. And this is on Petrero Hill. Star King Park. We'd like to talk a little bit about the sand dunes of San Francisco. They weren't a barren sand waste, as people like to say. Uh, but they were rich habitat for wildlife. This is an inner dune pond where about where Sunset Boulevard would be. This photo was taken in 1910 by Willard Warden. This is again the sand dunes of uh, the Sunset District taken by Willard Warden. I have the original glass negatives, uh, eight by 10 inch glass negatives of, of these pictures. And if you look in the background, you can see Carville out by Ocean Beach and one of the windmills on the right. Oh, I know I'm gonna push the wrong button. And uh, here's more, uh, you can see dune tansy and native lupin, lupinus chamaisonis. Um, and of course, all of this has been scraped away to build uh, the Sunset District. So not only do you lose the plants, but you lose all the plants that depend all the animals and insects that depend on these plants for habitat and sustenance and for larval food plants. This is a view of the uh, Sunset District in 1900, looking from uh, Golden Gate Heights. 
Carl Larson's Chicken Ranch down in the foreground. And uh, let's see, I've got this pointer here, so I might as well use it. So this is uh, Noriega, and this is 19th Avenue. <laughs> we need to improve that by building streets, right? And of course, in the background, we can see Golden Gate Park and uh, Adolf Sutro's Cliff House is right there, <laughs> Sutro Heights. And so we have, uh, these are, where you see the vegetation, it's stabilized sand dunes, and here is drifting sand dunes. The stabilized sand dunes um, are called swales because there's a high water table and uh, the plants, the dune plants have very uh, deep uh, tap roots that hold the sand together. And this is uh, a photograph you can see. It's, uh, I can't read it, my eyesight's gone. 1927, they're building a retaining wall uh, on Noriega Street with a Grandview Park in the background. Grandview Park, again, is one of the 32 significant natural resource areas under the jurisdiction of Rec and Park's Natural Resource Division. How do you describe a natural area? It means it's either a remnant of the original landscape, has rare or threatened species, or is adjacent to another natural area, and the combination of the two would give you richer and more diverse habitat. This is Golden Gate Heights, looking to Grandview Park, and the sand that came from the ocean how did it get there? Well, the sand dunes uh, came originally from the Sierra Nevada mountains. It's granite sand from the granite of the Sierras. Wind, rain, and erosion uh, eroded the Sierra Nevadas, and the sand came down the San Joaquin and the Sacramento River, came into San Francisco Bay, uh, tidal action washed it out through the Golden Gate, and then the northwesterly winds blew it across the sunset in the Richmond district, and in some places all the way to San Francisco Bay, seven miles. And in this location, the sand actually came up and over Larson Peak, which is now Golden Gate Heights Park, and then it came down onto Laguna Honda Boulevard down here. So that's 850 feet up there. So no place that we know of in the Western Hemisphere did ocean-produced sand extend up and over 850 feet as it did right here in San Francisco. And then the sand came down. The Garden for the Environment would be right here today. This is 7th and Lawton. And then when the sand came down here, it naturally dammed a creek that was running through this valley, creating two lakes, which I'll talk about in a second. Laguna Honda and another lake that was right here that has been filled in, where the pumpkin patch is, the Christmas Clancy's Christmas tree lot, which has recently been turned into a parking lot for UCSF. Which is the it's the Unified School District property, and this is what they do with their land. But I think the pumpkins are coming back. I saw yeah. signs. Okay. Right. <laughs> <laughs> Here's the same view today. Uh, so we're looking at the uh, Sunset Towers, which was originally called the Harney Apartments, built by Charles Harney, the same contractor who built Candlestick Park. Wasn't he a garbage hauler? <laughs> yeah, he was at one time, too. This is looking from uh, where Lincoln High School would be built in 1937. We're looking at the sand dunes that would soon be scraped away to educate high school students 
about how we uh, should preserve the planet. <laughs> and, oh, I'm sorry, I shouldn't. I went to Lowell. At Lowell, we, you know, land was destroyed as well. I live in a house, so I'm responsible. I'm a hypocrite. <laughs> oh, I'm sorry. I have to do this. Sorry, I'm a hypocrite. Um, and in this picture, we can see uh, one of my favorite plants, dune tansy. My email is dune tansy at yahoo.com. Here's Edge Hill Mountain, Mount Davidson, Sherwood Forest, and Forest Hill. 1937. Uh, this is the building of the Twin Peaks Tunnel on the West Portal side. And in the background, you can see Hawk Hill. And we had to fight to save Hawk Hill back in uh, the uh, 80s. Developers wanted to build housing on it. And we were, back in those days, it was very easy. I mean, you had to go to a lot of public hearings. But eventually, we would win almost every single fight to save these open spaces in perpetuity. Today, today it would be yes. uh, very difficult. Yeah. Why? Housing, housing, housing. The population of the planet increases by 230,000 every day. We need more housing. Of course, there's 60,000 empty buildings in San Francisco. That B is for housing. Yeah, what was that? That's Talk. Hoover Middle School. That's Herbert Hoover. And what is their mascot? <laughs> Talk into the mic, please. Right. Talk into the mic, please. Right. Hot up the. the I'm sorry. <laughs> I feel like Mick Jagger. Um, so this is one of uh, one of the great uh, San Francisco dune plants, Arisimum franciscanum on Hawk Hill, the San Francisco Wallflower. It only lives for two seasons, but it is a beautiful flower. And this picture was taken in the 1990s, and it's pretty much disappearing from San Francisco's sand dunes, although uh, it's fairly easy to propagate. You can see a lot of uh, wallflower on San Bruno Mountain. This is looking uh, across the Richmond district uh, to um, where the VA hospital would be today. Uh, this is 1912, and you can see Lupinus chamaesonis and wallflower in the foreground. You can see how dense the vegetation is in the sand dunes. This is a lady with her dog on a leash, fortunately, uh, walking where um, Washington High School would be constructed. Fort Miley in the background. And this is uh, the photographer, uh, Edward Mybridge, is standing in Calvary Cemetery, uh, near where Kaiser Hospital is today, the old Sear Sears and Roebuck, I don't know what it's called now. Uh, the Irwin Memorial Blood Bank. Uh, that was all Calvary Cemetery. And in the background is Laurel Hill Cemetery with uh, Senator Broderick's uh, headstone uh, at the top of the uh, cemetery. Really? Now, um, okay, uh, Joel, don't jump on this picture. Uh, this is uh, 1862. <laughs> Looking at Sans Souci Valley after the Great Flood of 1862, and we're standing where the U.S. Mint would be constructed. Uh, Sans Souci Valley means carefree valley. That's the old name, the French name of uh, the Lower Haight. So when we look at the Lower, this would be Fillmore Street, and this would be Haight Street. So you catch. The 22 right here, <laughs> the 7 8 right there, and then you ride up to the top of where Baker Street would be here. And here's Lone Mountain in the background. And 
This would be Alamo Square right here. This is Herman Street. 1862. And here's the same view in 1905. Oh. Sorry, I pushed the wrong button. Yeah, that's 1905. So our natural heritage has been obliterated, but there's our architectural heritage. And almost all of those buildings still survive today because after the 1906 earthquake, the fire never reached the lower eight. What street is that? That's Herman Street. This okay. is the wiggle. <laughs> yeah. Beautiful <laughs> architecture. Yeah. And this is an Edward Mybridge photo of two girls in their Sunday best mm -hmm. at uh, where Lafayette Park would be today at Golf and Sacramento Street around 1870 with Knob Hill in the background. Wow. And again, it's sand dunes, and it's predominantly stabilized sand dunes. And now we're up on Russian Hill looking to uh, Alcatraz in the background in 1851. All, it's all sand dunes, some stabilized, and some drifting. 1851. Now we're going to look at the grasslands or the wildflower fields. These are uh, people picking lupin in the Ingleside district from a postcard. And you can see this would be around uh, Juniper Sarah and Ocean Avenue uh, around 1900. And it's just covered with lupin. There must have been thousands of butterflies here. And none of that lupin survived today. And none of that was. <laughs> uh, another beautiful uh, wildflower field. This is Palu and Phelps in the Bayview Hunters Point with All Hollows Church in the background. Mm -hmm. uh, there are three lots that are still, that still could be developed on Palu and Phelps. And it would be nice if we could get open space funds to acquire those three lots, yeah. or we will lose a lot of uh, native plants. Mm -hmm. oh. This is Sky Lupin on Twin Peaks, an annual lupin. This is Clarkia rubicunda on Bayview Hill, an annual uh, wildflower uh, named for the Lewis and Clark expedition where they first uh, recorded Clarkia. Of course, the native people had uh, known Clarkia for 10,000 years prior to Lewis and Clark. And you can see the importance of the, the native plants. The native plants support the native critters. And this is a sphinx moth caterpillar uh, eating Clarkia rubicunda. Um, and this is an anise swallowtail caterpillar on, I believe it's Angelica. Peter? Can't tell for sure. Yeah. Um, and this is an anise swallowtail butterfly uh, on its larval food plant, Lomatium, on Bernal Heights. So the anise swallowtail lays its eggs on the Lomatium. It's also one of the few critters that has adapted to an invasive exotic plant. It is, it is adapted to fennel. Oh, yes. This is the bay checker spot butterfly. It's a threatened species with uh, ranunculus in the background, uh, California buttercup. Here's a close up. The bay checker spot. Gorgeous. And this is Viola pedunculata, um, a native wildflower on, on McLaren Park with Bayview Hill in the background. This is the larval food plant for the, uh, the endangered Calippe silver spot butterfly. The importance of native plants for the critters. We need to 
preserve and expand our native plant communities. We cannot destroy anymore because all we're doing is destroying ourselves. Because we are all one and life flows on within you and without you. George Harrison. <laughs> A dragonfly. We'll look at the uh, riparian areas, the lakes. This is Mountain Lake in 1899. Wow. Really? This is Mountain Lake in the 1930s. And the water from Mountain Lake and also from Lobos Creek uh, was exploited for drinking water, as you got, you know, people got to drink, animals got to drink, and the uh, water was brought all the way around the Golden Gate in a red, redwood flume, mm -hmm. and brought all the way around. This is Fort Mason, Black Point. Oh yeah, right. oh, it still survives to this day. This this is one of the only places where. Uh, San Francisco's original Bay Shore is still intact, right at the foot of <coughs> Fort Mason. And the water would then be, would go to this pumping station where the San Francisco woolen mills are, part of Gear Valley Square, and the water would be pumped up to a reservoir on Russian Hill. And you could subscribe to the private water service. There was no San Francisco water department until 1930s. So this is that part of uh, Fort Mason, the uh, where the original Bay Shore is still intact. It hasn't been bulldozed. It hasn't been destroyed. But all the rest of San Francisco's original Bay Shore has been pretty well um, just not destroyed, but changed. Um, and in some cases restored. That's the Jeremiah O'Brien Liberty Ship in the background. And uh, to build the roadway to the Golden Gate Bridge, um, a large chunk of Mountain Lake had to be filled in and destroyed to accommodate the roadway. And the National Park Service has just completed uh, repairing a lot of the damage that was caused by this roadway being constructed. All the uh, chemicals from the cars, the asbestos from the brake shoes, they all went into Mountain Lake, and so the bottom of the lake was badly contaminated. And the National Park Service and the Presidio Trust has recently completed a restoration of Mountain Lake. The impact of the automobile, uh, I'll show you a little bit, I won't get, we could do a whole slideshow on that one. But this was John McLaren's nursery in Golden Gate Park. The park nursery, um, and here's the, the same spot, this is at Frederick and Stanion, same spot today. <laughs> Most people don't even know that's Golden Gate Park. Now this looks like a park. But this is so ugly, how could it possibly be Golden Gate Park? Well, I've gone before the Wreck and Park Commission a couple of times with these pictures, and they just kind of giggle at me. <laughs> Thank you, Mr. Gar. Thank you. Uh, next speaker, please. And of course, the, uh, the slaughter of the wildlife all over the planet. Wherever the automobile goes, everything must die because you've got to pave over everything. Lobos Creek flowing through the Presidio, still supplying drinking water to the Presidio. It has a purification plant. And um, Lobos Creek Valley runs right next to this. And the, the creek is fenced off the pump, they do not want the public to go down there and put LSD in the drinking water. <laughs> <laughs> and here's Lobos Creek around uh, 1920 with uh, Lobos Creek Valley in the background, which has been beautifully restored by the National Park Service. 
And these are kids from Washington High School working with the National Park Service, restoring uh, the land next to Lobos Creek back in 1990. And this is a recent restoration uh, in the Presidio, the Tennessee Hollow watershed, El Polen Spring has been uh, taken out of the storm drain, out of the culvert, and is now a beautiful uh, freshwater marsh that flows all the way to the saltwater tidal marsh. Check it out. This is uh, a view from Pacific Heights to Washerwoman's Lagoon which you see in the background, Washerwoman's Lagoon. Um, a good story is uh, Ephraim Burr, his son would drink water from the creeks and from Washerwoman's Lagoon in the 1850s, but it was so polluted that he died of cholera. And so Ephraim Burr led the fight to uh, clean up the creeks and Washerwoman's Lagoon and get the slaughterhouses out of Cow Hollow. That's why it was called Cow, Cow Hollow. They had slaughterhouses. And um, he was, because of his uh, environmental activity, he was elected mayor of San Francisco in 1856. And in this picture, we could see coast live oak trees on Pacific Heights. Drifting sand dunes and Fort Mason in the background. Did Laguna Street run by Washerwoman's Lagoon? Yes, it did. That's why it's called Laguna Street. <laughs> Laguna and Chestnut. Another view of Washerwoman's Lagoon. It was filled in in 1882. And you can see in the Presidio, uh, Strawberry Island, uh, sand dunes at high tide, the water would come into the to the tidal marsh. Low tide recede back. No trees had been, uh, no pine, cypress, and eucalyptus had been planted in the Presidio. Behind this picture was taken. Behind Washerwoman's Lagoon, you can see two smaller lagoons just beyond it. Yeah. Right. Oh, yeah. This is the Laguna Seca at Parnassus and Cole. Uh, I mean, Seca, S-E-C-A, meaning dry lake, although it looks fairly moist here. Um, this was part of the William Ferdinand Lang Dairy, and I was fortunate to meet the granddaughter of William Ferdinand Lang when she was in her 90s, and that was in 1982. And she had a family album and I copied all the photos from that family album, of which this was one of them. And in the background, we can see the Metropolitan Powerhouse at Carl and Willard Street, supplying power to the second electric streetcar line in San Francisco. These houses are still on Carl Street. The date of this picture is probably 1894. Does anybody want to know what the first electric streetcar was? <laughs> sure. Yes, I do. <laughs> okay, spit it out. Who knows? The juice one. It was juiced, yeah. San Francisco and San Mateo Railroad. Right um, this is an 1868 uh, drawing, a bird's eye view, as they would call it, looking down on Lake Merced. And another lake right over here, what's the name of that lake? Right, well, Laguna Puerca is the Spanish name, meaning pig lake or hog lake. It was also called mud lake. And here's Lake Merced with a flume moving water around in uh, 1904. Another view of Lake Merced, cypress trees have been planted. The only place where Monterey cypress is indigenous is a small part of the Monterey Peninsula. It's a small part of the Monterey Peninsula. 
And um, you can see um, Lake Merced, this is the southern part of Lake Merced, uh, where you can see tules and uh, lots of habitat for uh, shorebirds and uh, freshwater marsh birds. Um, San Francisco is part of the Pacific Flyway, so birds, when they're migrating, will stop off in the lakes of San Francisco to get food and to rest. And this is Laguna Puerca, Pine Lake in Stern Grove as it looked in 1903. You can see there's a hell of a lot more water in there than there is today. All of these trees were planted by the Green family before Adolf Sutro planted his trees. So these are eucalyptus, pine, and cypress trees. And now they are reaching old age with very shallow root system. And they have a tendency to fall over in the heavy wind. As you know, the Trocador Roadhouse was crushed by a eucalyptus tree. It's going to cost the city two and a half million dollars to repair it. And these are some of the Parkside boys hanging out at uh, Laguna Puerca. Pine Lake in 1903. This is this way as Creek going through Glen Canyon yeah. in uh, 1892. Wow. Another view of Glen Canyon. There's a pumping station there. Uh, the water may have been pumped by Alfred Nobby Clark, who had Clark's Waterworks down in Eureka Valley in the Castro. He built that big mansion at Caselli and Douglas Street. So he built the dam in uh, Glen Park. This was then the Mission Zoo. And um, uh, used the water. Uh, you can see the whole valley is covered with iris. And in the background is the Gum Tree Ranch at uh, Diamond Street. This is the Mission Zoo, just about the same location as the previous picture. So they're having a big festival for Mission Day, September 9th, 1898. And here's the same view today. Uh, the Islay's Creek is still there, but it's running in a culvert underneath the uh, baseball field. And it goes all the way to San Francisco Bay. And here's Islay's Creek being put into a storm drain or culvert uh, where 280 and Alameda Boulevard are today. And up there on the right is the old Simpson Bible College on Silver Avenue. Again, if we were to really care about the planet, we would remove the freeway and we would daylight Islay's Creek. And here's some of the restoration work that's been done back in the canyon uh, of Islay's Creek. Laguna Honda. This picture was taken in 1862 when it was being converted from a lake into a reservoir. It is a native lake. So you would have sand dunes coming down from Golden Gate Heights up here, Mount Davidson here, with huckleberry scrub growing on that location. This is all wildflower fields and more wildflower fields on Mount Sutra. So as I said earlier, when the sand dunes came inland, they naturally dammed the creek that ran through here forming Laguna Honda and another lake where uh, the UCSF parking lot is today. Here's the same view today. So you can see there are no trees in this picture, but behind the photographer there were a lot of coast live oak trees. And here you can see pine, cypress, eucalyptus. There's a few oaks over there. And recently, trees have, have been removed here by the water department as they are preparing to plant all native plants around this part of the reservoir. Yeah. 
and they'll be working with the Recreation and Park Department on that project and with Nature in the City and volunteers. I can't wait to get down here. <laughs> yeah, but are they going to open it to humans? Uh, yeah, they will open it. They just built a new stairway uh, to allow uh, volunteers and workers to get down there. And this is the second lake that was located, the second lake that was located at uh, 7th and Lawton that was filled in around 1918, 1919. And it was, you know, on the maps it's called the Waste Pond. So people would just come in and just dump whatever they wanted to into the lake. Loxley Street would be uh, in the background right back here. Greg, I, I did some more research on this photo. It's actually, this is the... Yeah, I, we already discussed that, Joel. We did? <laughs> yeah, that because you were exhibiting this. But Same this, photo. But this wasn't the waste pond. This was up where the, uh, the screen house was. What? It was up where the screen house was at the, at the southwest corner of Laguna Honda. Okay, well, this looks like a lake to me <laughs> that's yeah. being filled in. It's the southwest corner of Laguna Honda. Yeah, and this, the, um, oh, yeah. the sunset towers would be built right in here. This would all be quarried away by uh, Charles Harney. Mm -hmm. and so you go, be, you look behind Laguna Honda, and you have, you have one of the uh, richest native plant communities in in San Francisco. It used to be all grassland, but now it's being uh, taken over by native scrub. Uh, that is sagebrush and coyote bush. That's because there's no grazing animals to control the scrub. There's no fire. And if there is a fire, the fire department comes out real quickly and puts it out. And there's no trails, so there's no dogs. And if you... I'm sorry, what? Yeah. Stop, stop, stop. We're going to keep going, but Chris is going to send a hat around, so if you like what you're seeing and you like programming that is free to come in and enjoy, um, please do, and if you want to support Planet Dream Foundation and Shaping San Francisco, this is where to put your cash while Ray continues to talk. Thank you. Okay, I'm going to move really quickly. Okay, this is the area behind Laguna Honda. Look at the diversity of the native plants. Indian paintbrush, native succulents, dudley and cedar, sagebrush, soap plants. It's just amazing. Hardly any human beings go back there unless we're unless you're doing habitat restoration. This is Mission Creek flowing through the mission through the mission district. Uh, this picture was uh, this sketch was made at Bryant and 16th Street where Seal Stadium would be built in 1930. Um, so you had the creek flowing here, and then you had Dolores Creek coming down off of Twin Peaks, coming down off of 18th Street, Caselli Street, and then into Dolores Lagoon, and then it would overflow and go into Mission Creek and out into Mission Bay. This is a view of uh, Dolores Lagoon, an artist rendering. How factual it is, it's hard to say, but this would be around 18th and Dolores. I've heard that uh, Dolores Lagoon was actually further uh, to the north. But this would be the Jewish cemetery where Dolores Park is today. And here's the Jewish cemetery again from a glass negative um, with uh, Petrero Hill in the background. All of this would burn in 1906. And here is the fire sweeping through uh, the Mission District as people are evacuating into uh, to what became Dolores Park, which was then called Mission Park. And that of, uh, is the original Mission High School 
that burned down in 1927, I believe. And the one that's there now was built afterwards. This is Alamo Square showing uh, the famous uh, Vict postcard Victorian on the uh, lower left-hand corner. The fire burning. The Hayes Valley, the Ham and Eggs fire in Hayes Valley, billowing white smoke. This is uh, on, Her we're on Herman Street again, and we are looking, this is uh, Laguna and Market Street. This apartment building is still there today. Oh, wow. And you can see the City Hall, um, the City Hall, Yeah, Laguna and Market. And uh, this would be the powerhouse for the Haight and Castro cable car that was destroyed by the earthquake. The fire would burn for three days. And this is an Arnold Genthe photograph taken from where Ina Colbert Park is on Russian Hill. Uh, Arnold Genthe was a very handsome man, and um, these girls are giggling at him as he's taking the picture. Uh, the caption underneath said, uh, uh, the fire may be burning San Francisco down, but it was springtime, and young girls have things to think about. <laughs> Now we're going to talk about the native trees in San Francisco. Coast Live Oak is the most prominent. This is Coast Live Oak in Golden Gate Park. Coon Hollow, uh, between, uh, on, off of Fulton, between 1st and 4th Avenue. Uh, named for, not raccoons, named for Mayor Coon. And then we also have a Pond Street, not named for a pond that used to be there, but it was named for Mayor Pond. Mm -hmm. So those coastline homes go way back. That's original. Yeah, um, there are some really old oak trees. Some of those oaks may have been planted by William Hammond Hall. And there were certainly, many of them were cut down when refugees were living in Golden Gate Park after the earthquake. Uh, but they stump sprout readily. This is the Age Grove today. It was the Deer Glen in 1899 when this picture was taken, although those are elk. But you can see all the oak trees in the background. Yeah, right. Yeah, yeah. The birds of Golden Gate Park, the most prominent bird in Golden Gate Park in 1932 when this book was written was the quail. Now they're all gone. There's no quail that we know of in San Francisco. Joel, you know if of any quail? They're all gone. There was a sighting recently, actually, in the city. Yeah. Wow. Yeah, it's kind of here. Wow. Yeah. But that was probably a released quail. Maybe. Yeah, you can see uh, all the quail right in front of McLaren Lodge in 1926. And now we're looking at the oak trees again behind the Conservatory of Flowers, just after the conservatory was completed in 1878. Mm -hmm. So those trees are fairly large, and you can see the original dome on the conservatory that would burn in 1882, and they replaced it with the dome that's there now. I call this the Squatty Dome. And this is Lone Mountain in the background, part of the USF campus now. This is a beautiful shot of Lone Mountain taken from uh, Calvary Cemetery, from Laurel Hill Cemetery. Lone Mountain uh, eventually became the site of the San Francisco College for Women. That's Archbishop Alamany's cross at the summit. This is Lone Mountain after the great snowstorm of February the 5th, 
And this is Shot Shotwell Street between 20th and 21st after that same snowstorm. And all of those Victorians are still there today. All of them. They've been altered, but they're still there. And this is uh, Woodworks Gardens at 14th and Mission. And these are all oak trees, Coast Live Oak. All oak trees. And this is a close up of Woodward's Gardens, and uh, you can see all the coast live oak. This is the California buckeye tree. They were very prominent in uh, Father Palou's diary when he first arrived here in San Francisco. He said there were hundreds of horse chestnut trees yeah. all along the Bay Shore. Because in Europe, the horse chestnut trees look very much like buckeye trees. But since most of the Bay Shore was destroyed, most of the buckeye trees were destroyed. This is next to the Caltrain station uh, off of uh, 21st in Pennsylvania. Still there today. And this is a beautiful buckeye at Willard North and McAllister, one block down from the Jefferson Airplane House. And unfortunately, over the last year, it has died. These are all buckeye trees on one of the Marin Islands, uh, which is a wildlife refuge. People are not allowed to go there. And you see all those little white things all over the buckeye tree? Those are snowy egrets nesting. Oh, wow. So again, it shows the importance of the native plants for the native critters. And how, what a paradise we could have on this planet if we just went in that direction. This is a bay tree. Uh, behind what used to be Notre Dame School at 16th and Dolores, one of the largest bay trees, and Mission Creek, which would have passed right by this bay tree, to the Spanish-speaking Californios, it was called the Creek of the Little Laurel Trees. This is now a big laurel tree. Now we'll talk about the non-native trees, Mount Sutro, Adolf Sutro planted uh, eucalyptus, pine, and cypress from Parnassus Avenue all the way to Ocean Avenue to create jobs for the city's unemployed, uh, to make the hills look more like the Black Forest where he had grown up, to beautify the hills of San Francisco. I mean, he wasn't an ecologist, and there weren't many ecologists around. He also got a tax write-off for potential lumbering. <laughs> This is looking from Strawberry Hill across the inner sunset around 1890 to Sutro's plantation. It's not a forest, it's a plantation. And this is from Cole and Carl Streets. This is from that uh, Emily Zaretsky's photo album of the Lang Dairy. Uh, Cole and Carl showing the Lang Dairy and the young saplings up on Mount Sutro, which was then Mount Parnassus and prior to that, Blue Mountain. Um, the uh, Sutro stewards have been maintaining uh, Mount Sutro for many years now, and they this year will plant 6,000 native plants on Mount Sutro. A lot of the trees are dying of old age, but unfortunately, the university, so uh, to not upset the residents, uh, when they took out trees, they also replanted trees. This is uh, the affiliated colleges, which eventually became UCSF on Parnassus Avenue in 1910, <coughs> before it started consuming the entire neighborhood. <laughs> Uh, this is the view of Mount Sutro when it was tremendously dense uh, with uh, eucalyptus, pine, and 
sign for us. This picture was taken in 1933. And this is the southern extent of uh, sucrose planting. That's Ocean Avenue in the valley. The Ingleside Racetrack, which uh, when this picture was taken had long been abandoned. So you see the wildflower fields here, and this is dense, non-native tree plantation. Can I ask a question? I, I'm just going to have to go fast. Uh, and if we uh, look at the same location today, so this is 1910, 1911. Here's the same view today. And here's the clear cutting of the trees to make way for residential development. Uh, Westwood Park, Westwood Highlands, Mount Davidson Manor, Balboa Terrace. And now we go and look at the remnant plantations where Sutro planted his trees. And what you see is two species here. You have the trees and you have English ivy. The reason English ivy is thriving in there is because the shade, the moisture dripping off of the trees, um, it's perfect habitat for this invasive exotic species. And now the ivy is climbing up the trees and it'll eventually kill the trees. So all you'll have will be English ivy. The trees cannot photosynthesize. Sorry. This is Cape Ivy climbing on top of the English Ivy. <laughs> Cape Ivy is from South Africa. Both terrible weeds. And the only reason that these, uh, these vines are here is because the trees created the perfect habitat for the weeds to spread. For the weeds to spread. Five grand. Okay. So if we look at the trees here, this is in the Presidio. Nothing's growing underneath. In Australia, the problem tree is Monterey Pine <laughs> from California. Uh, National Park Service has removed trees to preserve this endangered species, the raven manzanita. This is Twin Peaks on the right in 1886. Twin Peaks 1901, Twin Peaks 1940, known as Los Pecos de la Choca, the breasts of the Indian Maiden, to the Californios. 1951 snowstorm, I remember that snowstorm. That's how old I am. <laughs> Building Twin Peaks Boulevard, the dedication of the Twin Peaks Reservoir, supplying water to the hydrant system, a uh, western garter snake on Twin Peaks. Mission Blue uh, butterfly habitat on Twin Peaks. Uh, pearly everlasting on Twin Peaks native plant. French broom invading. Uh, work party removing French broom. Another baddie, Katoni Astro. Pampas grass at, uh, Big Sur, taking over Big Sur. Looking down Market Street, looking down Market Street. The Boy Scouts up on Twin Peaks. We'll skip this one. Tank Hill. Uh, Tank Hill with uh, native plants on it. Ethereal Spear. And this is Ranunculus, California Buttercups. And Clarkia rubicunda. We had to fight to save Tank Hill. It was acquired by the city in 1977. Corona Heights. Corona Heights being quarried. Corona Heights with the Castro cable cars running from a family album. Buena Vista from Alamo Square. The view to the eight in 1885 from Buena Vista. View from Buena Vista before the earthquake. During the earthquake and fire. 
1930. Mount Davidson before the trees were planted because there were many grazing animals on Mount Davidson and Twin Peaks. Mount Davidson, 1928. Nutka reed grass growing on Mount Davidson. This is the only place where huckleberry occurs in San Francisco on Mount Davidson. The view from Mount Davidson, 1923. The East Bay Hill Firestorm, 1920, or excuse me, 1991. Glen Canyon, 1942. 1942, Glen Canyon. Same spot. A work party in Glen Canyon. Billy Goat Hill with Gold Mine Hill in the background. Same spot today. Diamond Heights before it was developed. Diamond Heights before it was developed. Mount Olympus before it was developed with San Francisco's Statue of Liberty at the summit. Adolf Sutro erected this statue. It depicts the goddess of liberty conquering the demon of despotism. <laughs> the demon looks a lot like uh, President Trump. <laughs> and this was the 100 year anniversary of the Triumph of Light statue with the pedestal still surviving on Upper Terrace Street. Bernal Heights, Whoa. 1910. Bernal Heights, 1930s. Jake Sig giving a walking tour of wildflowers on Bernal. This is Mission Park, which is now McLaren Park. This is wildflowers in McLaren Park. This is the dedication of the name change to, from Mission Park to McLaren Park. And here's, uh, this is McLaren being serenaded with bagpipes for his 80th birthday. Bayview Hill. Bayview Hill. Same rock formation on Bayview Hill. Bayview Hill sticking out into the bay, chopped away to make way for Candlestick Park, and now Candlestick Park is gone. Wildflowers on Bayview Hill, the Presidio, Baker Beach, 1876, the Presidio, the Presidio Serpentine Grassland, tidal marshes, this is the original shoreline of the Presidio Grissy Field site during the Panama Pacific Exposition. It was an airfield. And here's the recreated tidal marsh, Yerba Buena Cove. San Francisco's original name was Yerba Buena, named for a native plant. Yerba Buena. Southwest. Southwest corner of Presida Park. Um, unfortunately, Greg, we have to give the computer back to Perry, so um, we've got to stop the photos. But thank you so much for the deep knowledge that you showed. 